hello everyone. Thank you to be here in this workshop about open science. So the next speaker is Bruno Vieira and he's an expert in open science. He is finishing his PhD in population genomics at Queen's Mary University of London. And yeah, he, he contributes to open science, open source, and he was awarded a fellowship by Mozilla Science Lab to promote open science. So that's what he's gonna explain to us. Thank you. Hey, let's see. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you for having me. Um, I'm, I'm gonna, sh I have many slides, so if I start speaking very quickly, just let me know. Uh, I don't intend um, for you to remember everything I'm gonna show, I'm just trying to be, be very broad. Uh, and the slides are available already at that uh, URL, bit.ly.phd day, and apparently it's gonna be recorded too, so you can uh, watch it again later. So, uh, yes, I'm finishing a PhD in London, and I got a fellowship uh, at the, end, the last year of my uh, PhD to promote open science. And during my PhD, I also founded an uh, open source community. So I was doing bioinformatics, and um, I was writing new code. And by making that code open, people started uh, contributing back and helping me. And suddenly, uh, this became a big part of my PhD and a project in itself. Um, but even though I'm doing a lot of open science, I don't actually like the word open science because it should just be called science. Uh, what I'm gonna talk about is doing uh, science that's reproducible and reusable. Um, and it's kind of amazing that this has become the exception, not the rule. Um, and it's not just about putting your stuff out there and available. It's also about making it easy to others to reuse your methods, your data, um, and make them uh, easy for other humans to understand. But I like the, that someone commented, uh, but please, for robots also. So if you structure your methods or your data um, in a good way, we can then write code, write uh, what they call robots, bots, that you use that data to generate new research. Um, so it's very important that we try to follow some uh, rules when doing these things. And so, to do open, si open science is any of these things. So you can have uh, open data, uh, you can share your data, you can share the codes that you use or the methods uh, to generate a result. Uh, you can do open peer review, um, you can publish in open access journals and also make the resources. Uh, so some universities are making their uh, courses available openly so anyone can uh, learn uh, remotely. And all this is open science. And doing any of this is better than doing nothing. So you don't have to do all of it. If you just start uh, with a small thing, um, and then move uh, to all the other things, it's better uh, than um, not doing it at all, which is the, the most common case. And um, so now I'm gonna show you uh, many slides from my friend Kirsty. Um, she was another Mozilla Science Fellow last year. And the reason I can do that is because she allowed me to reuse her slides, uh, because she's awesome. But also, if she didn't, her slides are licensed with a Creative Commons license, so anyone can just use them as long as they give credit back to her. So that's another important thing about open science. Uh, anything you do, you should license it. Uh, even if it's just a very small data set or a small script, if you put it out there, put a license, it's just a, a text file. Um, so that other people know if they can use your stuff or not, or what are the conditions. And um, so here is Kirsty, and you can see that uh, her slides are on GitHub, and she also uh, published them on a platform called Figshare. So that allows to have a DUI, so I can cite her slides in a paper if I want, uh, because they have a unique ID. Um, and this is what it looks like on Figshare. And so the license is here. 
here I see Creative Commons by, so that means that I can use this uh, and change it, uh, change your slides. I just have to give credit back to her. So you don't have to be a legal expert to understand license. Um, there's this website called Choose a License, which translates license from a legal language to a human-friendly one. And so if you just want to share everything, you can use something like an MIT license. But if you want to share, but you don't want other people to make money, uh, like companies to make money out of your research, you can use um, a GPL license that only allows uh, for academic purpose. Uh, if they want to make money out of it, they have to pay you back. So there's all, the, and if, you, if you're not doing code or if you're not programming, if it's just documentation or your methods, you should use a Creative Commons license. Um, and an another thing is that reproducible is not the same thing as open, so it's fine if, you should try to make your uh, science open, but if for some reason you can't, um, and there are some valid reasons sometimes why you, you, sh you cannot make your research open, you should always try to make it reproducible. Because otherwise if, if, you're, um, if you present something and no one can verify that, um, I don't think that can really be called science. So, and there's also a difference between reproducible and uh, replicable or reusable. And I'm gonna try to explain that. So, Let's say if you have your data set, your data, and you have code or your methods, uh, so it doesn't always have to be code, it could just be your uh, methodology. If you apply the same code to the same data, and you always get the same result, uh, that means your research is reproducible. And this should be the bare minimum uh, nowadays in research. Uh, but if you can take the same method or the same code, and apply to a different data set and get, if you're applying the same theory or the same algorithm, you get a qualitative, uh, quantitatively the same uh, result. That means your research is replicable. Um, but things start to get interesting when you can apply. Um, so let's say you created a new um, program in Python and someone else using the same theory or the same algorithm um, implemented in Python or someone else just wrote um, Excel formula on a spreadsheet. If all these people, when they apply um, this method to the same data and they get the same result, that means your research is robust. And finally, when you can apply a different implementation of your hypothesis on a different data set and get what you expect, that means um, your hypothesis is generalizable. Um, so as you can see, there are several levels and you should start first by making sure it's reproducible. That's the bare minimum. And then slowly try to move um, up. And there's valid, um, barriers to reproducible research. So one we hear a lot is that it's not considered for promotion or uh, it's held to a higher standard. So that means in academia, we focus a lot on papers and publishing papers in um, high impact journals. And sometimes they don't require your methods to be um, transparent or reproducible. And that means um, it's, um, you, 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 there's no incentive to spend time making your um, research more reproducible. But this is changing, so publishers are becoming more aware of this issue. Funding um, bodies are becoming more aware of this issue. And also, if you're applying for a job and your PI uh, knows any, anything about this, you'll be aware of it and you'll look that you actually know what you're doing and you might ask to look at your GitHub um, page or if you're applying for a company, they, they will look for that. They want to be sure that you know what you're doing and so if you make everything open and reproducible, they can check that. If not, uh, if you just have your papers, they're not sure what you actually did um, in those papers. And there's also a publication bias. So 
we still get rewarded a lot more for novel findings uh, and not for reproducing other people's um, research. And this is a real issue uh, and it also needs to change. And there are several people working on this to make this happen. But if we don't complain, if we uh, don't ask for this, um, it will take a long time for things to change. Um, another one uh, that's interesting, so it's in the US you can call, you can plead the, field, the fifth, which means if you, you don't have to testify if it's going to incriminate you. Um, uh, and it's a bit what happens with us if you, some people say they don't want to share their code or their methods because someone might find an error there and the paper might be retracted. <laughs> and so, but that's um, because we still, that's because of the publishing system is a bit broken at the moment because if we find error, that means you're, uh, that's a good thing. That means we can improve what you did and we're doing good science. If we just rely on science that has, there was a, a paper that um, was, I think it was in physics, it was very impactful and it generated a, a lot of other papers for the next 10 years. A lot of people relied on the findings from that paper. And then they realized later when they checked the code that there was a, a, an error there and one of the signs that should be a plus was a minus. And so it was about chirality in, um, in um, molecules. And so it's just invalidated the, the whole thing. But it could have been founded a lot earlier if the, um, the code was open and people could check it. Also, if you want to interrupt at any time, please uh, feel free to do so. Um, another reason to not do open science and make it reproducible that it, it takes time. It's a lot easier to just get your result, write the paper and submit it than, than trying to make, uh, document everything you did, put it out there on some platform, share it with other people. But if you do it from the beginning, it doesn't actually take that much time. It's only if you keep it everything for the, uh, the end. And um, also, it's good for collaboration, so you can collaborate with other people, but it's gonna be amazing for future you in six months. Because when you're doing something, you know what you're doing, but then six months after, you don't remember why you did this thing. And so if you make sure that everything is well documented and reproducible, you can help yourself when you have to reapply your method to a new data set, and you can just look back and figure out what you did. And you can support the, uh, so this one is, a lot of people don't want to share the things because they think they have to give support after. Like if I put my code out there, someone is gonna ask a question how to use it and then I have to reply and then I have to help them install my code or use my method. Um, you actually don't have to. If you're just aiming at publishing the paper, when you release your methods, you can say that um, here they are, you can use them, but I don't have time to provide support. You can put that in a file, in a readme file, and people will know that um, if they use this, they have to figure things for themselves. So you don't have to give support. People are not paying you to do that. If they do, that's nice. But if they don't, you don't have to do it. And the other barrier is that they require additional skills. Uh, and unfortunately, a lot of these things are not um, being taught at universities. Um, but things are also changing and there's a lot of material online. Uh, I'm gonna give you a lot of links to get you started, uh, how you can um, learn more about this. So, and you, you have to convince the supervisor or your PI uh, that th this is very useful and all these um, resources are out there. So they let, will give you time to dedicate to, to this. Um, yeah, so this tweet, this person was saying that you mostly collaborate with yourself. So that's a big reason. Big, if you want a very selfish reason to do open science and make your science reproducible, it's because you're gonna redo whatever you did and you need to be able um, to look back and know exactly what past you did. So another issue is that um, 
when you're doing field work or lab work, it's very hard to control all the variables and everything that happened. Uh, that's why you have a, a lab notebook to keep, try to keep track of things. Um, so if you're doing a lot of wet lab stuff, um, there's this website called protocols.io uh, where you can document everything you did, like how you mixed your reagents in your lab. Or, um, I'm not a big expert on protocols.io because most of the stuff I do is bioinformatics, so it's coding. Um, but uh, Kirsty uses protocols I a lot uh, for wet lab stuff. There's also this open science framework website, um, which is a mix between, you can, I think you can put uh, like your experiments, what, how you did them and what you used. You can also mix code and you can share code with other people and you can collaborate with them. Uh, so this is also a good platform, but there's many other platforms like this coming out. So depending on which field and what you do, you should look for whatever tool uh, makes it easier for you and for other people to reuse their stuff. Uh, so most of the things I do um, is bioinformatics and it's coding, and you would expect that uh, unlike field work uh, or wet lab, that in a computer you can control everything. You can control all the variables and everything that happened and have perfect reproducibility and reusability. But most of the time that's not what happened. And when you're writing your thesis or your paper and you have your final doc and then you send to your supervisor and it comes back with revisions and then you write final revision two and then it has more comments and you have final revision six comments, final revisions eight comment corrections final, final comment, corrections. So what you're trying to do here, and becomes really quickly a big mess, is called version control. Um, so you're trying to keep track of all the changes that happen and which one is the latest one. In a, and everyone does that. Uh, so this, everyone does version control. This is what version control is. But this way is not the more efficient one uh, to do it. And you end up with something like a folder that looks like this. And Six months later, you don't know which one is the final, 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 final uh, with comments. So I'm going to talk about a lot of things, but the main thing I would like you to keep is that the importance of version control. Um, and that's if you just do one thing, please do this one. Uh, that's the most important one. And it's not just for code. So that's another misconception. People think only programmers should worry about uh, version control. And no, if you're writing any text, your thesis, your paper, a cooking recipe, you can, you can do version control. And there's many tools and many platforms to do version control, but the most popular one right now, uh, and the one I recommend, is to use uh, Git and GitHub. And so Git is a tool you can install it as a command line tool, so something you type in the terminal. Uh, but there's also a desktop version, so you can just point and click uh, to execute stuff. And Git is going to keep track of all the files in a folder, how they change, what changed. And this allows, um, this becomes very powerful when you have several people working on the same thing. Because they can have, the, each one they can have a copy of a project and make changes. And then, they can merge all this change back. And if they were working on separate parts of the project, everything gets merged automatically. So the, the tool figures out what changed, when, and combines everything together. If they were editing the same file uh, and there's a conflict, um, the tool will tell you, there's, here's, there's a conflict. Which one do you want to keep? So usually um, the PI or the leader of the project will take back all these changes and then make the, the final uh, one. So if there's a conflict, you'll say, oh no, I want to keep this part of the code or this comment. Um, and so Git is the tool. But then there's a website, uh, which is GitHub. It allows you to collaborate uh, with other people and other projects that are using Git. Um, so there's a lot of resources out there how to learn uh, to use Git. Um, Mozilla has a bunch of them. Um, GitHub has one. So this one, uh, it's online, so you don't need to install anything. It will tell, teach you, apparently in 15 minutes, 
all the common line um, code you can type to, to do Git. But you can also, if you, if you don't want to learn uh, this, you can look for uh, the desktop version. And there are some tutorials how to use the desktop version. Um, so Git is open source, which means um, the code is open and, um, uh, and the tool is free. Anyone can use it. GitHub is a proprietary platform, so it's owned by a company, but it's the most popular one right now. So uh, most of the community and a lot of the open science uh, things happen there. So it's good if you have an account there and you use GitHub. But there's also an alternative called GitLab. And the, it's also a website, but the code of this website is also open source, which means you can just take this code and make your own website if you want. Like, for example, if you, want, if you have a university or a hospital um, and you cannot share, like you're dealing with human data and for some reason, uh, privacy reasons, you cannot share that, but you want everyone in the facility to have access to it, well, you can pay GitHub to make a local installation of GitHub that only the university can use and you pay a license for that, or you can take GitLab and install it on a server on the university, and everyone can uh, use that. So GitLab is an open source uh, alternative to GitHub. Um, and GitHub has a lot of jargon, but here I'm just going to try um, show that it actually does. It's not that complicated. Uh, a fork in GitHub just means you're making a copy of someone else's repository. And a repository is a folder. So you have a folder that has a bunch of files, a project. And when someone makes a fork, they're making a copy of your uh, folder. So they can make their own changes, and then they can merge back if they want. A pull request means that you made some changes, and now you want the owner of that repository to merge back your changes. So that's why it's called a pull request. So they're going to pull your changes. Um, and cloning a repository just means copying to your local computer. Um, so once again, I'm going to give a few links uh, with tutorials how to learn all these things. But as you can see, uh, this is just jargon for very simple um, things. This is what the GitHub page looks like. So you have a button here to make a fork of this uh, repository. So this repository is owned by this user here. This is the name of the folder. Here you can make a fork. Here you can see how many pull requests um, that project has. You can, have, you can look at the issues. So another cool thing about GitHub, it, it allows you to track people, projects, issues, tasks. So you can manage your whole organization, your whole research or thesis or paper um, that way. Uh, you can see here the files in, the, in that folder. There's a file called readme. And that file is, has a special meaning because it will be shown here uh, below uh, automatically on the website. So there's a few files that have a special meaning on GitHub. Um, and this is why you put, for example, the instructions, how s someone should use your uh, research. Uh, you can clone this using this URL. Or you can just download the zip file. So if you don't care about the version control, if you just want to get this tool, because someone published a new tool, a new method you want to use, you can just go on GitHub, search it, and download the zip file, and then run this method. Uh, and for example, if you, have a, if you want people to help you on your project, and you have a contribute file, um, it's called a contributing.md file. When someone wants to open a new issue or pull request, it automatically gets a link here asking them if they, if, they have, if they read the contributing guidelines. Um, so there's a lot of nice tricks with um, GitHub. Another thing that GitHub uses a lot is called Markdown. So Markdown allows you to write text like you would do in Word, for example. Uh, you can write italic, bold, you can put links, but without using Word. So you just use a simple text file. And for example, if you want to make it bold, you use two stars. If you want to make it italic, you use one star. So using this special syntax, you can create um, text files with some um, uh, markup. And 
because it's just a text file, it's not a closed format, uh, GitHub can render that and other people can change it easily uh, without having to install Word or have a license. Um, so Markdown is used a lot on GitHub, so if you, and also there's um, some, um, some people that are switching from Latex, for example, for writing their thesis, to writing to in Markdown. So there's a lot of cool stuff happening with Markdown. Another link I would like to give you um, is this oh shit git. Um, I apologize for the cursing, but it's a really nice website because another thing that happens is you learn how to use git, um, and then it's a very powerful tool. You can find errors, you can go back to a previous version of your code, you can, but at some point you might mess up and type the wrong command and it's all broken and then you don't know what to do. You're like, I just want my file back because I deleted this file. It's, I know it's still there because it's version control, but I don't know how to bring it back. So, oh shit git has a bunch of scenarios uh, when shit happens and you can, it tells you which command to type to fix that issue. Um, and if everything is broken, the easiest solution is just delete <laughs> your folder and clone it back from GitHub. So if, you're, if you have a copy always on GitHub, if for some reason you messed up, you can just delete and start again. And this is something that a lot of people do, but we always pretend we don't, we, because there's always a, a way to solve an issue with Git, but sometimes it's so messed up, you just delete everything and start again. Uh, and if you're not familiar with the, so as I said, there's a desktop version you can use of GitHub, and that installs Git. But I really recommend you learn how to use the command line version. It's not that difficult and um, it will make your life easier. Also, if you learn how to use the command line, you can automate a lot of your tasks. Um, you don't have to be a, to learn a new programming language or be an expert. There's a lot of small things like renaming files. Um, if you learn a, a bit of command line, you can do that very fast um, automatically. So there's this um, website where you can learn the basics of command line. And you don't have to install anything. There's a terminal here, so you can just type on the website. Um, if you have a Mac or Linux, you already have a terminal. If you have Windows, if you're using Windows 10, you can install Ubuntu from the App Store, and then you get the terminal, and you can also try this uh, locally. But if you just go to the website, you can start playing with the command line, and there's a bunch of things you can try to do. Uh, Another very useful resource is um, this Mozilla Open Science um, Open Leaders uh, Mentorship. So it's a program. If you want to learn more about, you have a project or you're starting a project and you want to make sure that you're doing it the right way and open and reproducible, and, but there's all this information, you're not sure how, which tool you should start with, how you should uh, approach it. Um, you can apply for this program, and for 12 weeks, um, you'll, ha you'll have a mentor, and you'll have online calls, and they'll help you figure out how you can make your research more open. Um, so this is very um, helpful to get started. And another very useful resource is the Gitter channel um, from Mozilla Science. So Gitter is a, another website that takes your account from GitHub and creates and your projects, your repositories, and creates a chat room for them. So you can go there and talk to, with, with other people. So there's a room for Mozilla Science, and there's a lot of open science people there for very diverse fields. So if you have any question, you can just show up on the channel and ask it, and I'm sure someone will um, help you with that. So, but, what if you cannot share uh, your code? Uh, you have a, your supervisor doesn't want you to share it until it's published. Uh, what do you do? Well, you can also apply for, um, so as I said, GitHub is um, a company. So if you, want, if you put everything open, it's free. But if you want to have something um, closed, so you, something private, that then later you can turn open if you want or not. You can have private repositories. You have to pay for that. But um, if you have an academic email, you get that for free. So if you just apply on this web page, they'll give you an academic account, and you can have as many private repositories as you want. So you can keep everything closed and still have version control and collaborate with your supervisor 
and uh, other people. But what if you can't share your data ever, for example? Well, this is an example from Kirsty. They had this scenario where they couldn't share this data because it was uh, patient data, so there was a lot of regulation. Um, and the access to that data was um, very bureaucratic. But what they did is they made a, a diagram of what you should do to access that data. If you need to, how do you apply, who do you, uh, which form do you have to fill, who do you talk to? And so this diagram is open and anyone that wants to have access to it for research can just follow this and figure it out. So this is a way to make things more reusable and more reproducible even if they um, cannot be open in this case for um, privacy reasons. And reproducible is different than open, and that's fine, as I said. Um, we should aim at both, but if you can only make your research reproducible, or if you have, a, that's another thing, you can have very badly written code, a hack, but something that works for you. Um, you don't have to be ashamed of putting it out there. Even if it's not reproducible, it's broken, you can, it can be open and other people can look at it and help you fix it, or not, but at least it will be there. Uh, so you should try to always, whatever you do in science, try to make it open if possible. So how much time do I have? Nine minutes? So I'm just going to give you an example of what um, a project looks like on GitHub, or managing a project. Um, and I'm going to give Bionode as an example. So this is, is Bionode started uh, as just a few scripts that didn't work, and I posted them on GitHub as a way for me to have version control and track them. And then they improved, and people started helping me, and we added more code, and suddenly it became a community. So I'm going to show you how you manage a community, but this could be your lab, your, your research, or your thesis. So this is what my initial GitHub page looks like. There's like a timeline of things that's happening and repositories I contribute to. And I can search for Bionode, and it shows me there's a bunch of repositories with Bionode in the name. So I have to figure out which one I want. Um, the first name is the organization or the user. So there's a Bionode Bionode, there's someone else um, Bionode, there's a bunch of tools. And you can also see users that have Bionode on their profile. So there's me, another Bionode contributor, and here's the organization. So you can have users on GitHub, or you can have organizations. So if I click on the organization, Bionode, I can see there's, um, I can see the repositories, and there's a bunch of them that are pinned. So that means they are, um, the Bionode organization thinks they are more important, so they show up at the top. You can see the activity on that specific tool, which language it's using. So there's a bunch of tools in the Bionode organization. You can see who's working in that organization. Uh, you can filter it by tags. And then the, the users in the Bionode organization you can set uh, permissions, what they have access to or what they have not. And so you can manage, um, for example, outside collaborators that way. Um, you can manage teams on GitHub. And this is um, a, a cool thing you can do with GitHub because everything is uh, uh, open and reproducible and programmable. So this is the web, the Bionode website, and you can see people working on Bionode, the community, people that participated in our events, events. And this information comes from GitHub. So the website is fetching this automatically. So we don't have to manually update it. Uh, we can just get all that information from um, GitHub. And now you can also add a project board on GitHub. And this is very useful, especially if you're not, if you, if you don't, if you're not coding anything, um, you might use GitHub uh, one reason might be to use this project board because it allows you to manage what your tasks, what you are doing in your project. So a project board looks like this. You have columns and you can make these columns. So for example, here I have all the issues um, that are in the log, in the backlog, what we're going to do next, what's in progress, and what's done. And you can move these tasks 
around and you can assign them to people and you can see what's solved and what's not. Um, we're also using labels um, for our issues like if it's a problem it's red, if it's a new thing we put a green so with labels you can also quickly glance and see how many issues you have, how many new features. Um, we also have a special issue where we put the roadmap of, of the project so we keep updating this issue uh, and you can do all this from the website so you don't have to code anything, you just edit and add more information here. Um, this is the um, repository of the website, the Binode website, so you can here see all the files of the Binode website and because it's using this special name GitHub automatically makes this a website so this is what the website looks like so you can have your own website for free by just putting some files uh, on GitHub and now I'm going to show what the pull request looks like so here someone opened uh, an issue, there was a problem with the website and there's here a label red, the person that opened it. And that person not only opened the issue, but they actually solved the problem. They made a copy of the folder, they solved the issue, and now they're asking me to merge back the change they, they made. So they open a pull request on the website, and this is what it looks like. It's open. Here I get a notification that this person opened uh, the pull request. And I could just merge, look at the code and see if it's uh, okay and merge, but I actually have a bunch of checks to make sure that everything is okay first. So the first check is I'm gonna do a review of that. And that means I can open the pull request, the review on the website, and I can look at what changed. So the red uh, lines were deleted, the green one was added, and there's a bunch of other changes you cannot see. But if I approve, I can just say that I approve this, and now the changes are approved. So once the changes are approved, another cool thing that you can do with GitHub is you can add some automation uh, to your project. So the website, there's a service called Travis, and this is called continuous integration. It's a more advanced use uh, tool that you can um, use for your research or your projects. But what this means is that there's a server, there's a computer that's going to take the website, create it from uh, this version that changed, and if everything is okay, um, it tells me that the, the, the website, the change didn't break anything. So once all these checks pass, I can merge the pull request. So now it's all green. And I've done all this from the website. So I didn't have to open uh, editor or um, command line. And then you can merge and uh, you can delete the, the old changes uh, because you merged them. And here you see that the issue was merged and was solved. And here in the project, you can see that um, it was in progress, and then we moved it to done. So this is what a pull request workflow would look like um, on GitHub. And um, this is another cool thing, because we track all these things that are happening. We can know who did what on the project, and we're using a tool that uh, uses emoji to tell what, who did what. So you can see that a lot of people contributed code, some people contributed documentation, um, and so some of this information is fetched automatically from GitHub, but some other information is manual. So some people just contribute to discussion, so they have like a discussion um, emoji. Uh, so this, way, this is a way to give uh, credit to everyone that contributed. Uh, to this project. So Git allows you to version control your text, be it code or not, and GitHub is the website that allows you to collaborate with people that are using Git and projects that are using Git. Um, how much time? Two minutes? Okay. So I'm not going to have time to explain this, uh, but this is how I do a reproducible paper in my, my the tools I specifically use for my research and that might change for your field. Um, this is a diagram of all the environment I use to do my research and it starts as a, 
a PDF. That's the output I want. It's a PDF so I can submit to the journal. Um, but the cool thing is you can mix code in your uh, PDF. So the code you use to generate your figures, you can mix that in the PDF. And you can use things like NITAR or LaTeX, or you can use things more interactive, like, for example, this project, Stencilla. You can write here your text, and you can put here some code and generate a table. So there's these interactive notebooks you can use uh, for reproducible research. And then I use a bunch of different language, and each language has a way to manage the tools that were installed. Um, you don't have to worry about that if you're not using that language, but what I want to show is that you can keep track of all the, the, the libraries you used for your research. But then um, the other issue is how can people reuse all these things, you, all these tools you're using? And so a lot of things that have, um, one tool that's getting very popular um, in bioinformatics is Docker. It just allows you to put all the stuff you did in a, what they call a container. So it's like a virtual machine. So it allows people to just take that and rerun everything without having to figure out how to install the tools. Um, because this is what a bioinformatics pipeline would look like. And you can see there's a lot of interdependencies going on. Um, so this, these are all the tools I use. Um, I'm just leaving this here so you can see what it looks like for my case. But for, if you're in your field, you're just using one tool, um, a very specific tool. Maybe you don't need to worry about um, these things. I'm just. So if you want to know more about things like this, here are some links. So I think the most important uh, take out of this workshop is that if you don't have a GitHub account, you create one and you try to, to use it. Uh, as I said, the version control is very important. Um, introduce yourself to the Mozilla Science community. Um, Go there, ask questions, tell us what you're doing, uh, what you're studying, um, what issues are you facing to try to make your things more open or more reproducible. Um, learn the basics of version control. I'll leave this link here, but there's a bunch of tutorials out there. Um, document and comment everything you do as much as possible. Even if it's really annoying, future you will thank you for it. Um, and these are more advanced things, but if you can, when you generate a figure, put the code used to generate that figure and the data in the paper or somewhere someone can find it. It's amazing that when you, find, when you look at the paper, you cannot access actually the data that was generate, used to generate that plot or how that plot was done. Uh, and you have to, if you want to take that data out, you have to actually type the values back uh, to a spreadsheet or to um, a data set. Um, and then if you're doing a lot of programming uh, and you have very complicated tools, make sure other people can use those tools without having to learn how to install them or set them up. As I said, there's technologies like Nix, Docker, or virtual machines. You know, Just put everything inside a virtual machine and share that so other people can uh, rerun your experiment. Also very important, try to submit your papers uh, to pre-print archives, like archive or bioarchive, so that um, other researchers can see what you did and maybe help you improve it. Also, you don't have to wait. If you're waiting a year, two, three, four, or five for the paper to get published, um, that's five years that people don't have access to your research. So if you put it out there, right away when it's done. Even if it has issues, or you can always change it. You can revise it. And it's also a way you can say, hey, I'm doing this. Um, if you want, you can help me with it. Or if someone, people are afraid of being scooped, that someone will steal. They're, they cannot steal it because you've put it out there. You were first. If someone published in another journal that has, more, that has impact, that's uh, annoying because of the incentive system we have right now. But you can always go back, hey, but you took this uh, result from my paper that was on the archive, and you can shame that person if you want. So it's, if your name is there and it's out there, there's no way people can steal it. 
um, try to submit to open access journals uh, as much as possible. And lobby for changes uh, in the current academic publishing and funding system. Uh, changes are happening and a lot of funding um, and publishers are becoming more and more aware of these issues. Um, but if we want to accelerate this, we need also uh, to push for, for changes. Um, and that's it. If you have any questions, um, please ask. I'll be around also after lunch. Thank you. So we have a couple of minutes for questions. Are there any questions? Yeah. Yeah. Hello. I'm also working in mathematics or learning in biology, and I work in a supercomputing environment. I have a problem. I mean, I have two problems facing this thing of version control. The first one is that version control machines they don't have internet access. Sorry. They don't have version machines. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I can do real version control as I, as I do in my job on my desktop. The second one is like sometimes I'm dealing with files that are connection from camera to some files. So in these cases, so what, what should I do? Like check the camera? Like if I cannot set a real version control in my system, what would I do? So um, you don't need internet access to use Git. Um, yeah, yeah. But, um, so, um, but you, those machines never have access to to internet. Or can you access them in some way? Because yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. the thing is that I cannot do like I do normally like pull requests and. You could. Um, yeah, it's it's a bit. Um, it's a bit annoying because if you bypass the whole GitHub uh, workflow, it kind of decreases the, the, the productivity. Um, I'm not sure. Um, but why those machines don't have internet access? Is it because um, they cannot have, because one thing you could do is you could have like a GitLab on one machine. If it's like behind a firewall and that they cannot have access to the outside, you could have a GitLab and use GitLab as GitHub. Well, it's not, it's, you can still do it. It's just you cannot collaborate with other people doing version control in that. You could still collaborate. Like you can tell someone, here's the folder with my tool, just copy it to the other machine. And it's still version control, so it's fine. It's just you lose all this benefit from a platform like GitHub. But you can also, you can use GitLab or you can ask your university or institution to pay GitHub to have a private um, GitHub locally on the on one of the machines, and then it's exactly the same as GitHub, but just without the community, because it will be just for your environment. So that's one way uh, to solve it. Okay. Do we have any other questions? No. So I have more like a general question. Mm -hmm. Do you think there is like a, some fields within science that are more enthusiastic about the whole open science? thing or you don't see differences in your experience? Um, well, it depends. Uh, one thing I see is, so I, I see usually there's a, there's a lot of um, bioinformatics, genomics, uh, high performance computing. Uh, I think some of them come from the fact that they were already doing some coding, so it was an, an easy transition, mm -hmm. but you see other fields that like ecology, uh, doing um, field work, they are moving their results to platforms like GitHub. But what, what I think I see one big incentive um, that I see every field to get on this is scaling. 
because you don't need to worry about any of this when you're like one lab in the wor world working on this very specific mm -hmm. thing and you can do everything manually in a spreadsheet and you only share with one other person, uh, your supervisor, whatever. So, yeah. But as you start to have to share it with more people, you start to have to use more machines, you have to um, bigger data sets, data sets you cannot open on Excel. As you start having to scale and you start in hitting roadblocks, mm -hmm. then um, you become very enthusiastic about this from a very selfish perspective. It's just, this solves your problem. Yeah. You know, you, it's, uh, uh, that's how a lot of the um, people get into the open science. It's not about, it's, a lot of people it's because of the ideals, but some people is just, hey, I have this problem. The only way I can analyze this data if I do this way, if I can version control it because it's mm -hmm. too much data. It, the, yeah. the old methods just don't scale. Mm -hmm. So I think it's scaling is, the, the big, is one big factor too. The other thing I, I was thinking, I don't know about you, but I have the impression that uh, here, at least, I don't know, in Barcelona or in Spain, we don't talk much about open science as in other countries. I see in the UK there are, there's a lot of people moving to this and being very advocate about it. Have you found differences between countries? I think, I think also um, this might come from the pressure from funding and from publishers. As they become more aware, they say, it's like, you don't have to worry about any of this if your objective was just to get the paper out in nature or science, and that's mm -hmm. it, and you, you, uh, yeah. you're set. Uh, but once your funding says, hey, no, you have to put your code this way or that way on GitHub, on this platform. For example, I think um, some funders actually create their own platform and say, hey, you have to put whatever you do, it has to be open, it has to be here, stored mm -hmm. on this uh, website then people start to worry, oh, so mm -hmm. I cannot get yeah. funding because uh, it has to be open. How do I do open? Well, what's Git? What's GitHub? How okay. can we? And so that's, that becomes the incentive. Um, mm -hmm. And so maybe you don't hear a lot about it here because maybe there's still not that incentive. Mm -hmm. So if your funders change that, or if, if you, probably, you try to publish a paper and it gets rejected by the reviewer because it says, hey, I cannot access your code, or I cannot do this, I cannot do that, mm -hmm. then you have an uh, immediate uh, reason yeah. to yeah, do yeah, it because otherwise <laughs> you don't publish it. So, yeah. so it has to be that way. So, and yeah. this, as they become more aware, this is going to change, change more. Mm -hmm. um, but it will be better if it was faster, uh, if you want yeah. to actually make <laughs> real science that is reproducible and open. Otherwise, all the, the, all, many of the papers I see in my field, um, they seem very interesting, but then I cannot reuse re those methods. Uh, they say mm -hmm. they use a custom script, or sometimes they say uh, methods available by request. And then you request and they say, oh, the postdoc left. So I don't know actually how where the code here is or where the data is. Yeah. Uh, so we really need to fix this. So probably uh, we all need to change a bit our culture, the scientific it's, culture. I talk a lot about the tools yeah. because I'm, I get very excited about all these toolings. Yeah. But at the end of the day, it's all about culture. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not, there's several tools for several fields, mm -hmm. for several issues, but it's all already there. So the only reason we're not using this is mostly cultural and incentives. Mm -hmm. um, so that's yeah. where the big change needs to happen. The tooling, that yeah. stuff gets figured out uh, later. Yeah. I think probably uh, part of the problem is that maybe because we have to change the culture and maybe the, the researchers that have been investigated for a long time maybe more like and uh, also happy about mm -hmm. changing things and maybe the young people who are now right like early researchers who are taking the lead and yeah probably it's a uh, well, yeah it's gonna take to, some time yeah, like to mm -hmm. combine supervisors that are not used to it maybe but with time, probably as we'll get to it, huh? PhDs become PIs and they had to face exactly. these issues because they were doing their experiment and the experiment didn't work. Mm -hmm. And also, a lot of these things are getting um, like there's a lot of resources to learn this, mm -hmm. and s some of it is part of the curriculum of some masters and undergrads. So things are, yeah. are getting there yeah. slowly, and at some point, it will be the, the norm. Okay. Um, but right now, yeah. as I was saying, aiming just at making things reproducible, yeah. like that will be, then we, we can aim at reusable yeah. and better and, well, but yeah. just making sure that I can take what you did and redo it and get the same result, 
that's the bare, that should be the bare minimum uh, yeah, for science. I agree. So if there are no more questions, then just a uh, big applause to Bruno again. Okay. <laughs>